you have stepped into Reader's Labyrinth. And here is your host, Frank Shepard. Hey there, if you're watching this on YouTube, please give it a like and hit that subscribe button. It helps me reach a wider audience. Thanks for stopping by. Hey there. Please welcome Dr. Vivian Evans, language expert, digital communication technologist, as well as fiction and nonfiction author. Dr. Evans is an expert in language and digital communication, and in his writing and research, he likes to explore the language and mind and the relationship between the two. He is the author of several books on language, non-linguistic communication, meaning, mind, imagination, their evolution, the impact of technology on language and the future of language and communication. You can find him discussing these topics and more on a regular basis in broadcast media to include TV and podcast appearances. He has a regular column in Psychology Today called Language in the Mind. You can also find his blog, language creates, and in his popular science writing, which is found across multimedia platforms. The reason why Dr. Evans is joining me today is because he is the author of a wonderful fiction book called The Babel Apocalypse, a genre-blending dystopian sci-fi mystery thriller that will make you think about language in a whole new way. Today, Dr. Evans joins me not so much to talk about his novel that's coming up soon, and as all of my readers are aware, I like to sit down and at least be able to read the story of an author before I speak with them. However, Dr. Evans reached out to me across Twitter, and I was just very, very impressed with him. What follows is a wonderful rabbit hole where I sit and listen as he lets me know about language, thought, and time. And oh boy, what a wonderful exploration this is. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Evans into the labyrinth. This is a book about language. It's, it's set about 100 years, several 100 years in the future, where language is no longer learned. There are no native speakers of language anymore. It's um, Taking the idea of, of language, language streaming, we have language chips in our heads um, with the downstream consequences that happen as a, because of this in terms of how language is learned or not learned and big tech corporations uh, owning language. Uh, because of this, and on my background, I'm an academic linguist and a cognitive scientist. So I have a PhD in linguistics. I spent oh, nearly cool. 20 years okay, uh, yeah, teaching yeah. Uh, language and how the mind works as a professor of linguistics. Um, my PhD is from Georgetown uh, University in Washington, D.C. Uh, and because of this, the, the book has a lot of different languages in it. There's a discussion of language and an exploration of language. And there are characters that speak different languages in the book, um, some invented languages, some real languages. So there are, there are characters that speak Romanian, French, uh, Dutch, uh, different varieties of English, including different varieties of North American English, uh, British English, and invented varieties of English that, that may exist in the future. Your book sounds so fascinating. I cannot wait to get my copy of it in the mail. I'm going to be ordering myself a copy. And uh, yeah, I mean, it That's sounds kind really, of really say, neat. Frank. Well, so um, I'm really interested in your background then. So you clearly have a background in languages. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that, if you don't mind? Sure, yeah. Um, I started off in my early 20s as a language teacher. So I was trained in mm -hmm. teaching English as a foreign language with various qualifications. And I worked in France as an English language teacher and then in South Korea. And through uh, happenstance, a twist of fate, I ended up in Florida um, and did a master's degree in linguistics at the University of Florida. Uh, and then from there, I, I was lucky enough to earn a scholarship uh, to do a PhD in linguistics at Georgetown University. 
And then I um, got a job uh, as a as a professor, assistant professor of, of linguistics back in the UK. And I spent the next 16 or 17 years uh, working as a professor of linguistics. I began publishing uh, my writing career began with technical books on language, developing theories of how uh, we process language, how we use things like what are called conceptual metaphors in language, which reveal things about the human mind. Mm. Uh, so I'll just give you a quick aside for you and your, your listeners uh, so you mm. understand exactly what this entails. So if we want to understand how we think about abstract concepts like times, nothing much more abstract than time in the sense that it's not something you can see like trees and rocks and mountains. It's something that we feel and we experience, you know, each time we in the passing days and weeks and months, we look, our, look at our reflections in the, in the mirror and we understand events passing in time and so on. We can use language. I'm what's called a cognitive linguist. So I use language as a means of studying as kind of a laboratory to study um, how the mind organizes information, the concepts and ideas that give life to our to our lives and how we make sense of the world around us. So if we take something like time, if I said to you the Easter bunny is around the corner or Christmas is coming, no one gets confused and think the Easter bunny is around the corner, or Easter's around the corner. If I said Easter's around the corner, you don't get confused and think, if I walk around the corner, I'm going to actually see the Easter bunny. Or if I say to a kid, uh, Christmas is coming, but they think Father Christmas is going to knock on the door in a minute. We understand that we, uh, when we use these everyday expressions in English, a language like English, that when we talk about coming, we're using space, motion through space, and elements placed and situated in space as a means of understanding how time works. Because we can't see time, we use aspects of our embodied experience, our spatial experience, our everyday experiences of walking around and banging into things in the world to structure time to structure the concepts so that we could handle it and and actually think about it using these kind of more concrete spatial markers and then the thing that's interesting about time is that something like time is that it then turns out that other languages do things in remarkably different ways so there's a uh, an American Indian, a native indigenous language called Aymara, spoken in parts of South America. And in that language, uh, rather than the future being situated spatially in front, they wouldn't say, I, I can see the face of things to come, which is a kind of a hackneyed common expression in English. For Aymara speakers, culturally and linguistically, the future is located behind and the past is located in front. And the reason for that is they use a conceptual metaphor to structure it in, in which they, the conceptual metaphor is knowing is seeing. So when we say things, I see what you mean, we don't literally see what someone means. You use the, the concept of vision to structure what knowing and knowledge is like, because when you see something, you know it. So from this perspective, what the Abara do, which is really super cool, is because the past hasn't yet come, well, the past has come rather, future hasn't come. Now I'm confusing myself. You see how confusing this is? <laughs> yeah, because, yeah. The, the, because the future hasn't yet come, it's behind because you can't see it yet. Whereas mm -hmm. the past is located ahead because you, have, you can see it. So because the idea is in it. English. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So in, in English, we talk about uh, Christmas coming or Easter coming or, uh, or uh, he hasn't, she hasn't got over her divorce. So the divorce is in the past, located in the past. So it's behind. Um, so we use, we talk about temporal things using motion through space, whereas Amara think about the, the, the speakers of that particular language. You said you wanted a highbrow conversation, Frank, so I'll take you. <laughs> this is it. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Come on. I am all game for but this. In, yeah. in Amara, they um, they use the the metaphor of um, knowing is seeing, so vision meta, a vision metaphor to structure time, not the spatial motion metaphor which we do in English. No matter which variety of English you happen to speak, British, um, my stiff assed variety, or uh, or your sweet dulcet American tones. Um, so you have these organisational differences that crop up. So you're asking me about my background. So this is by way of explaining. Uh, some of the, the, the research that I undertook, and I wrote these technical books on 
on how the mind works using language as a laboratory. And from that, then I moved, it was a natural step to start writing textbooks for students of language and mind that were used in, that used in, all, in many English speaking universities in North America and the UK. Um, and then from there, I, I branched out into popular science books. So I, I wrote a book that caused a big uh, controversy back in 2014 called The Language Myth. And this rebuts the prevailing theory held by language scientists that language is some kind of instinct, that we are kind of born with the rudiments of, of language. Uh, this is developed by a very famous guy called Noam Chomsky. He's probably more famous yeah, for his yeah, political yeah. views mm -hmm. than, uh, than, yeah. than language. And has been uh, peddled by... Uh, in Popular Science by Steven Pinker, who's a well-known public intellectual. So I wrote this book called The Language Myth that uh, rebutted this kind of view and explained that, in fact, language derives from experience. Not It's not an instinct as such. That's the wrong kind of metaphor. And then from there I moved, I developed uh, and, and wrote the first um, popular science treatment of emoji. Um, as a system of communication using language science to understand how this new form, this was, I got going with this in 2015, um, trying to understand the, the significance of emoji as a system of communication. And this came about because back in 2015, that was really the year that emoji as a system of communication uh, went mainstream. I mean, now we sort of take it all for granted, but it really went mainstream that year. There was a case where a 17-year-old um, uh, African-American in Brooklyn posted three police officer emojis um, with, with pistols uh, pointing at these officers. And this uh, young man posted this in a public status update on Facebook and then was uh, an arrest warrant was sub subsequently issued under the 9-11 statutes that were, were introduced after 9-11 in, in New York. And the guy was arrested um, for a, a, an alleged terroristic threat. And no one knew what to make of this. And someone from the Guardian newspaper uh, contacted me and asked me if I'd be willing. They couldn't find any experts who knew anything about emoji. And, and the question was, can you say something for our readers um, as to explain why it is that emojis can be used to make a terroristic threat when in term, under the terms of the New York statutes introduced against terrorism following 9-11, uh, this only viewed threats as being possible by language. And so from that perspective, I started thinking about emoji. And myself, I didn't know that much about emoji. And I realized that emoji is fulfilling the same communicative functions that language fulfills. And there are basically two of them. The first is that language has to represent an idea. So in English, we take the three sound segments, ka-ata, cat, and we all know as English speakers, we all agree as a community of English speakers, that if you sequence those three sounds together, that will refer to the pet of choice for many people in Western households. The second function of language, the communicative function, is the interactive function. We use language to perform things. So an obvious example of this is when a member of the clergy or someone who has the, um, the civil authority to do so can pronounce two people, two individuals, husband and wife, for example, in a heterosexual marriage ceremony. And those words change the tax status, the moral obligational status of those two individuals, their conjugal rights status, how society views them, that status is changed, not by the signature of signing the marriage register or whatever it happens to be in whichever jurisdiction one is based in, but it's the words themselves, and that's called a speech act. And we do that all the time. If I say to someone, please shut the door on the way out, I'm trying to influence their behaviour in an aspect of the world to suit my own wishes using language. So we, we interact with the world. And that's exactly what the, the emojis were doing. They were conveying a meaning and they were trying to, according to the New York district attorney, trying to influence others to go around shooting police officers in the, right, in the light of uh, the, the grievance that this... Uh, young man had with respect to the you know the Black Lives Matter movement, um, so that was that was the the analysis. And from there, I then wrote a uh, a book called The Emoji Code uh, that was published. Uh, this was a published. Uh, this was back back in those days before I was an indie author. I actually had a literary agent, and I published with the Big Five traditional publishers. This was published in the US by Picador Macmillan, 
uh, and did really well. But then it was a next step from there to start thinking, okay, now I'm doing language technology, figuring out the future of language. And you can't then do that. If you want to talk about the future of language, you can't then do that um, if you're doing it from a research perspective, because you've got to take the status quo and the state of the art and figure out what's going to happen next. And the thing that interested me was what the, the kinds of things that were happening to emoji started happening to language. One thing that's happened to emoji is that it's not owned by people, but it's owned by big tech. So proprietary. Um, yeah, so it's basically Apple and, and Microsoft and so on, uh, an institution, an NGO called Unicode that is based in, in California, determines what are the permitted emojis that we have on our smartphones and tablet computers and so on. It's not us as individuals. And in 2016, this organization decided that it was no longer going to populate the handgun emoji with a handgun, but was going to turn it into a, a water pistol, a harmless child's toy. Um, and in a way, whatever one thinks about gun crime, and I know particularly in the US, this is a, a very heated topic and for, for good reason. But whatever one thinks about that, this is a form of censorship. The other thing that, that got me interested in the future of language and the move then with the Babel apocalypse to think about um, the downstream consequences of language streaming technology, which is really what the book is about, was then um, warnings in two, from 2015 onwards by many of the world's leading uh, computer scientists that in the future, humans face an existential threat potentially from the rise of AI. Now we're seeing that. You, you opened right at the beginning by talking about um, chat GPT and, and the kind of ethical and problematic issues that we're seeing now with, with authorship and, and, and so on. And I wanted to ask the question, well, if we have smart AI becoming as powerful and more powerful than human uh, intellects, and then we have a sort of a, um, a rebuttal of that or a, a move against that to hybridize the human mind, which is what someone like Elon Musk has been trying to do and others like him with yeah, his Neuralink yeah. mm -hmm. uh, startup. So the idea there is that we can use uh, new technology to implant neuro neuroprosthetic chips in the human brain to enhance the human brain. And from Elon Musk's perspective, this in the first instance, has a medical benefit, but ultimately he wants to create transhumans, so people with smart microcomputers in their heads to allow us to compete with smart AI so we don't get left behind, we don't get wiped out. So if you have this technology, what would the consequences be? So back in 2020, Elon Musk predicted that language will be obsolete, language learning will be obsolete in five to ten years. Now that's that's wrong. But I took that idea, I, the idea had already, already formulated because I started writing the book in 2019 before he made that wild prediction and, and asked myself, what if language in the future is just like music, is just like movies in the sense that we can stream it over the internet? With the advent of um, internet ecosystem from space, which is being developed, um, so we have massively powerful broadband connections 24 seven from space that encircle the earth. And in a future, in around a hundred years, the technology will exist that we have potentially language chip implants that allow us to stream language without ever having to have, to have learned it. We already, since about 2010, 2012, scientists have been able to map how the brain, electrical impulses from the brain produce language, even in the absence of the articulatory abilities. So what that means is if someone, for whatever reason, um, suffers some kind of injury, so they can't produce using their vocal apparatus language, their brain can still think the language and this can be picked up by an artificial synthesizer to produce that, that those basically read thoughts using a neuroprosthetic neuro implant. So in the future, if we have this technology, what are the consequences? So the Babel Apocalypse asks this kind of what if question. It takes the prospect, the highly probable prospect of the technology existing by the end of this century, that we can have language chips. We don't need to learn it anymore at the mother's breast, so to speak. You see, you lose a mother tongue and you can stream it as you think and talk from Internet and space. What would be the consequences of that? 
and the the book starts with this um, apocalyptic event, a global language outage. So just like we have an electricity outage or whatever it might be, or an internet outage, if you have evil corporations or if you have hackers or whatever it might be, and you have this global event that's highly unlikely, um, it's low probability, but one for which the planet is completely unprepared because the entire ecosystem of people, you no longer have native speakers, they're dependent on streaming language. What would happen? What would be the consequences? And that's the premise of the book. So that's sort of my background, my story. You, you asked how, what my background was and how it led me to, to this particular project. That is so fascinating. Oh my gosh. Like, um, and, and terrifying too. Oh my gosh, Viv. Mm-hmm. That's like, um, so the idea of language, um, being streamed into your mind, would, would that be like mm-hmm. a conversation like, uh, you and I are having, would that be a bunch of Im- images, I guess, or would it, would it be language that you're thinking without any verbal aspect to it? So, what I've done is I've made some assumptions, but I'm starting from current technology. So this is based on, so this is a work of hard science fiction um, in the sense that I'm being realistic uh, given what is current the state of the art in terms of research. And by the way, um, Neuralink, Elon Musk's startup venture that is uh, investigating these neural uh, these neuroprosthetic implants recently received approval from the FDA for in, in the US for um, human testing. So this is now moving forward a pace. But in terms of your question, what, what would this look like? Um, you would need a language chip that has this technology to be resilient in a wet, messy environment, namely the human brain. It would need to connect as, as a minimum um, to the two language areas of the brain. Most people don't realize that the brain has language areas. It has what's called the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area. The Broca's area is the part of the brain that produces language. So when I'm speaking now, that connects with all the muscle systems, the mouth, the, the, um, the different parts of the uh, articulatory elements, the tongue and the es- esophagus and so on, uh, that allows me to produce spoken language. And then what, what I'm doing when I'm listening to your questions and you're, what you're doing now is your Wernicke's area is lighting up and that's processing and comprehending because you're a, a native speaker of English. You, you can produce, you can uh, understand what I'm saying despite my weird accent. Where I come by, from, by the way, I don't have an accent. So that's funny. That's cool. It's a wonderful <laughs> accent. I love it, by the way. Thank you. Thank I, you. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So you have this language chip that connects to the different parts of the brain. It would also have to connect with areas that allow us to draw down concepts and concepts for different part, different things that we experience are, um, are widely distributed across the brain. There's not one area of the brain that holds concepts. So the, the visual part of the brain stores concepts for things that we see like dogs and birds and identifies their shapes. The amygdala, which is an older part of the brain, that stores concepts and experiences relating to emotion. So language then hooks up to these different things so we can actually, because what we're doing when we use language, whatever language it happens to be, Swahili, Japanese, French, English, it doesn't matter. So we're basically symbolizing, we're using a symbol, so something that's physical, in this case sound, but it could be writing, that's also physical, or it could be assigned gestures and sign languages. We're using a physical sing, sig, signal to encode and externalize a concept so that you understand what it is I'm trying to get across to you. That's that's what language basically is. So the language chip would connect to those different elements of the brain. Uh, and then you would need a transceiver. So this is the, the stuff that people like uh, New- and Elon Musk's uh, team are working on, probably behind the ear, so you can get the Wi-Fi signal from the internet and space ecosystem that connects through something equivalent to Bluetooth to the language chip. Then what you would have is you'd have the ability to, uh, rather than using the mental store, what's called the lexicon that we have in our minds when we learn a language, to know which words hook up in whichever language it happens to be to a to the, the ideas that you want to express, you don't have to learn language anymore. So if you imagine, I, I don't know 
if you speak any other languages or how many languages you might speak, whether you've tried to learn any languages, maybe at school or whatever, back in the day, uh, it's a hard process. You know, learning French or German or whatever it happens to be, learning what the different words are in those languages. It's a laborious, painstaking process, and you have to build a new mental lexicon in your head. So basically a dictionary. So that it's as comfortable, ultimately, as speaking English. We don't need to think about it. You're just drawing down the words from this dictionary, basically, you have in your head. You wouldn't have that anymore. You need to you wouldn't need to learn the language, not even as a kid, because what would happen is you would simply you would you you would your your thoughts would pick up whichever lexicon you have you were subscribing to. So say you subscribe to Apple Music or whatever it happens to be, and you can get as much music as you want per month. It would be the same kind of thing. You'd have a, a monthly subscription that you'd pay for. You would, if you uh, if you lived in the United States, then for many people, English would be the language to subscribe to. You could subscribe to a multiple, a multi, a multi lex. I'll put my teeth in. Sorry, a multi lexical package if you wanted Spanish as well or or some other languages. Um, more languages would cost. If you have a multi package, that would be more expensive. Most people would probably just stick to one one language and they would just stream it. But say you wanted to go to to Japan, you could then get a Japanese package on top of the. Um, on top of the English one, and just start streaming Japanese using whatever ideas you happen to want to convey, you'll be able to stream them. And so the advantage of this kind of technology is that it doesn't limit um, aspiration. You have complete leveling up. You're only constrained by how much you can afford. So you could go to Japan, you could fall in love with a man or a woman from, from Japan, you could um, work in Japan without any problems anymore. Say you wanted to be a rocket scientist or a tort lawyer or an astrophysicist. You could download a specialist lexical package and you'd know all the, the terms that you need you'd have, that you could hook up then to the concepts so you'd be able to express yourself and do those kinds of jobs. The, the disadvantage of this kind of uh, system, however, is that um, you have a unique IP address just like you do with a computer that's linked to the language chip. So with this kind of system, basically, you are a homing beacon continuously because you're basically just like a smart computer, your smart telephone. Um, you are but constantly Monitors. beaming to internet. And, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. privacy has gone forever. There's a forever record of who, who you've been with, where you are. So the advantage of this from a, a state perspective is that you, at a stroke, eliminate crime. You have you can identify who's done what when, who they've been with and where. From the from the user perspective, the advantage is that you have voice command technology. So because you've got this unique uh, in the book, it's called a SEC code, which stands for security code. So a unique 15 digit number that's unique to the uh, the language chip, and that is transmitted every time you speak via metadata and speech over the Wi-Fi signal. So you can get into your, your house, your car, your office, into your retail uh, venue, um, just by speaking through voice commands to a microphone in the door, which are called in the book VIRDAS, which stands for Virtu Virtual Digital Assistant, and you have perfect security. So theft is eliminated, and equally, perpetrators of crime can be detected instantly. So it's kind of like better than the minority report. You don't have to figure out what's going on in the future. You, 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 uh, there's a forever record of everyone. Um, but then, of course, you have issues with civil liberty, potential censorship. So one example of censorship would be this. In a particular state, say, for argument's sake, the United States, um, something like abortion, whatever one feels about abortion, uh, say for argument's sake that abortion is outlawed under all circumstances, then the state can decide in that jurisdiction to eliminate or proscribe the word abortion. So users of oh, English yeah, in that particular yeah. mm -hmm. um, jurisdiction can no longer, you've cancelled the word. You know, this is cancel culture at the level of language. The word is cancelled, so people can't express the idea, they can't even think about it. And you, they have the Kafkaesque situation that, say, in um, parts of Europe, say in England, um, abortion hasn't been outlawed. When you switch, if you fly across the Atlantic, you travel across the Atlantic, you go to that jurisdiction, you can suddenly 
access it and stream it and talk about the concept again. So, and you can see that if, you've, if people have got computers in their heads, these language chips, then the cyber terrorism hacking become problems potentially. You have issues of censorship, you have issues of overreach by the state. Uh, authoritarian regimes can, for their own ends and purposes, change the law or massage the law so that certain lexical choices are, are removed. You have a situation that's even worse than George Orwell's 1984 with Newspeak and Thought Crime to, and so on. I yeah. was just about to bring and, up uh, 1984. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. And these, this is a, this is a, a a real uh, potential scenario given this, this technology. And this is exactly what the, the, the book explores. Um, and it, it, the book explores it, the mouthpiece of the, uh, the, the mouthpiece of this warning, basically, which is what the book amounts to, is Professor Eva Black. She's one of the two main protagonists in the book. She remains through a loophole in the law. She remains the last unchipped uh, native speaker of language anywhere in the automated world. Uh, she doesn't have a language chip. <laughs> wow. She's a polyglot. Yeah. She's a professor, professor of linguistics, and she leads a, a resistance movement against um, this state-controlled system. And the, the other issue that's interesting is that states would naturally, in this kind of hypothetical future, would want to ensure that all the population don't go what's called feral in the book. Basically, they, they can function and they're functional members of society. So what states would do typically would have a single language that's accessible on all the public Verda systems, these virtual uh, digital assistant systems that provide access to ha homes, door offices, cars, retail stores, and so on, where you can identify yourself through a voice command which reads the metadata, the SEC code, the IP address in your head. So in the United States, it's conceivable under such an arrangement that English would be the, the language that was selected that is the, pub, the single public language that's used on all these systems, which means from the, the benefit of people who are on lower incomes, that they only have to have a single lexical package, because multiple lexical packages with more languages that might include Spanish and French and whatever, uh, are more expensive to, to, to stream. So you have, as, a minimum, as a safety net, you just have one language. So, so you have this kind of situation, um, and it's ripe for disaster. It's ripe for this kind of slippery slope um, situation where things can be prescribed. You can have vetting of words, which means their removal. You can have Kind of the sense quasi censorship, which is what's happened to to uh, emoji, and in this hypothetical future imagined in the Babel apocalypse, everything starts with California. So there's a public referendum, hundred years hence, and the the, uh, the population is asked, do they want to begin a process of mandatory language chipping? And then you go through a transitional generational phase that after 18 years, once everyone has reached, every adult has been chipped after 18 years, all newborns then must, by law, undergo language chipping. So within a generation, you no longer have any native speakers of language left. So then you're entirely dependent upon big tech and anything that goes wrong which is what happens in the Babel Apocalypse, which is a language outage, causes absolute disaster and catastrophe for civilization. You know, I am reminded of Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of folks here in North America, they're constantly looking towards the government as a threat to their freedoms mm -hmm. and the definition of what it means to be a human being. But in the book Fahrenheit 451, it wasn't the government that started burning books. It was groups of people. It was these social groups that didn't like certain types of books, and they started to burn them. And, yeah, they did. And everything that you just described is a concept that Andrew Gilsmith, um, another guest that I've had on this show, that he described to me, this unholy alliance of big money capital, tech, mm -hmm. and corporations. And they're the ones that's really driving all of this. I mean, it isn't really coming from the government. The, the government now, the nation state, is starting to become downstream of technology and capital now. 
wherever you have capital mm -hmm. and technology, then you have the shot caller of the nation state now. And yes, I mean, it is. it's some really, really scary stuff out there. Yeah. I mean, it's some scary stuff. So, right. um, and what well, so my question then is this, is like a lot of the motivators of trans transhumanism and folks that want to make us in the cyborgs essentially is the idea is that if we can marry, you, you know, the human brain to this emergent technology mm -hmm. to make us more competitive with AI, A, would that really make us competitive with mm -hmm. the super intelligence, assuming it, it reaches that level? And B, um, I have a sneaky feeling that it's going to be a lot easy to scale intelligence uh, through an AI program than it is to figure out the neural links in a human brain. But am I completely off track on that? Because, or what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, just going back to Gil Smith's work, I, I know uh, you're probably referring to things like, um, I mean, his writing is so cool, uh, Our Lady of the Artelects and so on. Oh, yes. And yes, I just, am. Yeah. just going back to, to that for a second, I mean, one of the, the important points he makes in that, in that book is a critique in part of, there are lots of different critiques, uh, but one in part is the, uh, the Chinese region and the, the cultural genocide that's taking place uh, to some of the, the demographics there. And China is, in a way, there's been a real-life example of the Ray Bradbury book that you began with yeah, uh, in yeah, terms of burning yeah. books, because, of course, under Chairman Mao and the Cultural Revolution, that is exactly what happened. And it wasn't, you, you rightly say, with Bradbury, it, was, it began with groups of people. But in the Chinese context, this was actually a state-sponsored endeavour um, to remove aspects of the past. And of course, books are a, a powerful artifact and cultural emblems of the past and the future and, and the present as well. Um, so I think there are real life examples of this. Um, in terms of, you know, AI and hybridization, um, I do think that this, this is going to happen, that the, the, the challenges are really not intractable in terms of how this works. There already exists the technology to have a, um, a, a neuroprosthetic implant that won't degrade in the brain, um, that has sufficient brand bandwidth. There are several companies that have this. And what's interesting about Neuralink, which is the Elon Musk company, is that it's also developed a robotic surgical system to implant it with perfect accuracy. So you actually have that already. There are uh, pathways in the brain that mean that you can pick up on particular pathways that provide massive control to different areas. I talked earlier about concepts being massively distributed, but you in fact have pathways that are, that are quite centralized in terms of the brain. So you can um, pick up a lot of this information and have these bi-directional um, communicative systems so that um, language can reach these com uh, these concepts and that are activated in different areas. The big problem I foresee at the moment is everyone's neural impulses are different; they're unique to each brain. So that is the chat. That is the challenge, uh, but that will be overcome. I think um, we can already map individuals' um, neural systems, so we can replicate what they want to say by reading their brain thoughts. And then, as I mentioned with VoiceGram technology earlier in, in our discussion, that already that technology already exists. So I do foresee, I mean, Elon Musk is can often be bombastic and, and, and problematic in a range of ways. Talking about Twitter, that's one example of a, a dumpster fire, perhaps, for, for some people at least, um, in terms of management. But his, his claim that language will be obsolete or language learning will be obsolete in five to 10 years is plainly just wrong and sensationalist. And maybe that was the point. I don't know. Uh, but it's certainly the technology will exist. Uh, that's for certain. And a lot of people, or at least some people, do view creating a hybridized mind where we become basically cyborgs as a way of staying ahead and avoiding the existential threat that uh, perhaps others fear from very smart AI. The question then, the philosophical question I think that's interesting then is, 
Well, if we're complaining now about things like chat GPT, replacing authors, replacing art, creating book covers using AI, or actually books that might potentially in the future become masterpieces generated by AI, what then happens if you've got a hybridized human mind that's actually taking advantage of, of some of these developments to do exactly that? If, if language is no longer owned by people, it's no longer learned, it's no longer acquired as a, as a baby. You know, by the age of four, uh, most cognitively normal children the world over speak at least one mother tongue. You know, by the age of four, a, a kid that can't ride a bicycle or tie its shoelaces is a linguistic genius, which is quite a remarkable thing. What happens if we strip that out? Are we then, have we replaced chat GPT with ourselves? And we're not really artists anymore. We're using chips in our, in our heads to help. The other issue is that there would need to be to control all this stuff. You would need a body-borne computing system. And in the Babel apocalypse, that's imagined as a a wrist chip that's connected to the ear transceiver and the language chip in the brain. And that allows us to project what's called a holotap, which is a holographic translucent screen that's controlled with uh, eye tech fusion technology, which is actually, um, we're starting to see. So you can blink command things on your computer and so on. So this would be like a portable tablet that you can hibernate in and the projection shuts down, it's 18 centimetres wide. You can think of it as a sort of holographic tablet computer that you house in, your, in, a, in a chip in your wrist. That would allow you to control the language chip in whichever language setting you want. So you could subscribe to um, new languages, or if you cross a national state line or a border, a national border, you can stream a different language by upgrading your monthly subscription and so on. So you've got all these other things that we have to take into account and think about. But in, in terms of the, the question, I think the, the technology uh, will exist and there will be some significant challenges other than the, you know, the censorship, censorship challenge, the civil liberty challenge. It's also a very real philosophical uh, dilemma, I think. We might become, we, when we have chat GPT in our heads, what does that make us? We could be the next evolutionary step on the planet. I mean, would we Indeed, be a human yeah. being then yeah. at that point? I mean, yeah, I mean, we would yeah. have to. I mean, what is it? A uh, Homo erectus, Neanderthal, Homo sapien, and then what? Um, Homo cyberic. I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, but yeah. but then again, I no. mean, the transhumanist ideal is that that's exactly what they want to do. They see themselves as. Mm -hmm. I guess, producing humans as the next evolutionary step. And um, yeah. I have some extremely mixed feelings about chat G GPT, um, mm -hmm. namely because I see uh, folks who have never tried to write before are getting into the water now and they're totally using it as a crutch. And they're like, well, research is difficult. So I'm going to, you know, turn to the machine to tell me, you know, how a nuclear submarine works. Well, Writing dialogue with conflict is difficult, so I'm going to rely on the machine. And I can see a standard template construct emerging from AI for stories now. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's like already the future is being shaped by this technology, and it's kind of unsettling. I mean, it's totally unsettling. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that artificial intelligence? And I know this is a very philosophically loaded question, but do you think it could ever obtain consciousness or become a sentient being? Um, and and I, I don't know what your broader worldview is, but, um, you know, are we ever going to see something where, you know, a machine says I am or wake up, I, I guess, for lack of a better term? I mean, I think the... I think the issue is that uh, you can have a synthetic consciousness that actually simulates consciousness. So there was a, a story recently where um, in the United States, there was some war gaming going on in the, uh, the Pentagon. And in the war game, the AI uh, eliminated, killed the, the generals, the commanders of the, of the war game because they were preventing it from achieving the scores that it did. Uh, taken to achieve, it was supposed to achieve in terms of whatever the war gaming scenario was. 
So it's okay. We need to stop it. The human we need to stop the AI development. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it it, it so, eliminated I mean, the this, generals. <laughs> yeah, because they were sorry. sorry. They were. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you have the you know going back to people like Isaac Asimov um, in the robot series of books and stories from like the 1940s onwards with the the ethics of AI, thou shalt not harm humans, and so on. And talking again about Andrew Gilsmith, just alluding to his work, he has this very similar or analogous, very interesting uh, idea of pruning that he discusses with the artilects, the synths in his book, Our Lady of the Artilects, where the, the, the synths have to go through um, this process of pruning to, to sort of gain them and to test that they can act in a, uh, a rational and moral way and be safe to be used around humans. So I think it's, poten it's potentially, I think this issue of consciousness is the wrong way of thinking about it. I think you can simulate that code, computer code, is not the same as a human brain. It can achieve identical results, even better results than a human brain, using different means because it's using mechanical, robotic uh, AI means to achieve the same thing. So you can have a level of consciousness that is not quite the same as human consciousness that, that achieves similar kind of results. Um, and I think this goes back, you know, to the, the, you know, the idea of the Turing test after the famous British mathematician who asked, you know, is it possible for humans to um, to simulate consciousness? And the test for this is whether you can have a conversation with them without realizing you're in fact having a conversation with a computer. And the answer is yes, that is becoming clear that that is possible. So it's a different type of phenomenon that we're dealing with. It's not consciousness in, in terms of the, the synapses and cells, the wet matter of a human brain that's producing it. Um, the brain evolved originally to control a, a body and make sure the body stayed alive. Um, but the, there are simulations of this that would achieve exactly the same effects, pass the Turing test. Um, and then we have synthetic thought and synthetic consciousness that's achieved in a different way. So I, I do think that this is probably inevitable. I think that hybridized human minds are inevitable. And I hope something like the Babel apocalypse and its dire predictions are not inevitable. But language is power, language is control. So one of the, the, the key messages, the slogans from Eber Black, the protagonist of the Babel apocalypse, is that they who control language control everything. Language is the hallmark of what it means to be human. We fall in love, we convince people to vote for us or not vote for us. We get divorced using language. We use language to transact and enact our daily lives, to make friends, to influence people. Advertisers use it to woo us and to get us to buy their, 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 their goods and their items. It's, you, you don't have to be a Shakespeare um, to know how to use language. We are all geniuses at it. And it takes the, 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 the kind of the Shakespearean feats of the extraordinary to reveal many things in, actually about the ordinary that we do, we all do all the time. Um, and I think without language, we're, we're nothing. But I do think these, the things that are neuroprosthetic implants, synthetic consciousness, I do think they are inevitable. The world's on the verge of uh, the fourth industrial revolution, sometimes abbreviated to 4IR. And this is the, a revolution that um, involves connectivity, smart AI, and the Internet of Things. I briefly alluded to a letter, an open letter published in 2015, earlier in our discussion. And this was signed by many of the world's leading computer scientists, as well as other leading scientists, Stephen Hawking, the famous, the late Stephen Hawking, who was a very famous British uh, astrophysicist, was a signatory, as was, interestingly, Elon Musk. And what this letter said is, that, and it was accompanied by a, a short report, is that given the advent of the world's fourth industrial revolution, we do need to have strict controls and policies in place to um, prevent existential threats to human beings. And that doesn't just mean, you know, something like the Terminator series where Skynet blows up the human race because they see the humans as a threat, which actually ironically 
uh, mirrors the situation that I talked about with respect to earlier with respect to the uh, Pentagon's war gaming situation, but also things like employment. The second book in the series, The Available Apocalypse, is the first book of a six book series called Songs of the Sage. Now, the second book, which is coming out next year, is called The Dark Court. And that takes the idea in it. All the books in the series look at the idea of language as a potential weapon of mass destruction if in the wrong hands. Uh, but one of the central conceits of the Dark Court next year is that um, employment in the future will be a thing of the past because of automation and AI, and all manual jobs in the automated world will be eliminated. And then what do you do with all the what are called unskills? You have a, a caste system based on IQ, and if you're an unskill, you're permanently unemployed, and the state has to look after you with federal schemes to make sure you have a minimum wage because you're never going to work. But then what happens to these people that have no kind of purpose as a consequence of automation? So an existential threat needn't just be, you know, something dramatic like Skynet and Terminator trying to destroy the human race, but also these kinds of issues. What happens in the future when you have no work anymore? You know, so what would Bruce Springsteen have to sing about, you know, if, if, if all the workers have been laid off, for example? You bring up a really, really good point, too. Um, whenever you bring up the existential threat of AI, a lot of people, there is this cognitive dissonance. And I think that's why it's been ignored for so long. But the bleak world of unemployment, um, of mm -hmm. the financial impact, and, and not only that, but anyone who's watching this, to the vast audience that is watching Reader's Labyrinth, <laughs> um, if you're thinking to yourself, well, my job is safe. I'm a lawyer. Well, my job is safe. I'm a brain surgeon. I'm sure there's an AI program right now that's gunning for you. It may not be written mm -hmm. yet. It may be in the past that's in front of us or the future that's behind us, right? Like that tribe in South America. Mm -hmm. But I can't think of a human endeavor now that AI could not replicate and do better. Um, mm -hmm. and like, I mean, because if you can scale up intelligence enough, then there is no, uh, white collar job. There is no creative job mm -hmm. that is not going to be able to do better. And, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I mean, what do you do with the load with the surplus human beings? And I had another guest on, um, a while back and he said, uh, which I'm not trying to like name drop another guest as I'm talking to someone, but he said, what if it's like um, Arthur C. Clarke's uh, It's Childhood's mm -hmm. End, where, hey, this is just where this phase of humanity ends and this is the next chapter. Don't try mm -hmm. and fight it, but this is where we end in the new intelligent species on our planet is going to be silicone based. I mean, it's mm -hmm. because even if you have a hybrid, unless there's massive, massive genetic modification going on, um, I don't see how a hybrid, we might be able to compete with an AI for a couple of decades, but eventually that intelligence is going to scale up. So, um, yes, I don't know. And, uh, there, um, so I'm sure that, uh, you've heard of the Fermi paradox, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the solutions to the Fermi paradox is that um, all biological carbon-based life gives way to silicone intelligence, you know, this artificial intelligence. And then after a couple of generations, that artificial intelligence, it physically scales down to a microscopic level. That's why, like, mm. when you look out at the universe, you wouldn't really see it, <laughs> you know, or you wouldn't see, like, a Dyson swarm or something like that. But um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Viv, um, it has been a blast. I need to get going. Um, I'm about 30 minutes over, but this was gold. Oh my gosh, this is gold. Um, I cannot wait right, to get into your book. Oh man, it's certainly has. Thank you so much. Yes, fantastic. This pleasure, is definitely right. going to be a classic way up there. Thank you so much for Good. coming on. Absolute pleasure. And thank you for having me. Of course, of course.